The situation currently taking place in Myanmar is abominable. There is no safety anywhere, and the world has all but turned its back on an entire people trying to claim their freedom and insist upon their human rights in the face of blatant evil and inhumanity. International media seems to have moved on to the next story, scarcely reporting on this one anymore, even as the horror continues. We at Insight Myanmar Podcast find this intolerable, and we stand behind the Burmese people and their courageous effort to live in dignity. This platform is dedicated to making sure that we keep the conversation going, while ensuring these voices continue to be heard. Today's guest is one of those voices, and I invite you to settle in and open up to what follows. this episode of Insight Myanmar podcast, we're going to be speaking to a Burmese living abroad who's been doing much to help some of the medical missions there for his safety and anonymity. We are just going to be referring to him as Shade. So Shade, thanks so much for joining and talking about your story and some of the aid work that you're assisting in country. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me here. Mm, right. So before we get into uh, what's been going on since the coup and how you've been helping out with some of the underground medical network, which is quite interesting and also quite valuable for our listeners to understand and hopefully be able to support your work, let's learn a little more about you. So as far as you're able to share, given safety and anonymity concerns, whatever you need to say in a generalized way to not be so specific, can you share a bit about your background, where you come from, and how you ended up in Australia and when that was? Yeah. So um, just to give a bit of my background. So yeah, I'm from Myanmar. Um, yeah, I've been living in Australia quite a while. Um, yeah, uh, studied abroad and I've uh, been working here. And yeah, and uh, since coup happened, um, I've, I was finding ways to help people back home, supported the CDM movement, um, involved in various activities as well. And um, yeah, I just decided that, you know, um, I needed to do something about the coup and this is all happening and I couldn't just stand by and watch. So I began to, to be involved in various activities and then um, suddenly uh, found out that uh, some of my uh, closest, uh, my people who were pretty close to me were working with, hey, we're doing this medical network thing back in um, uh, in Zagang and uh, all those regions. So they were like, um, do you want to help? And I'm like, sure, because I was also... I was already involved in like various fundraising activities to help people with all sorts of like humanitarian aid. So yeah, and then, and here I am um, working with them and then just pre pretty much just helping out with fundraising and not just fundraising really these days, just helping out with logistics, communications as well, just talking to various organizations on their behalf. So yeah, um, yeah that's pretty much a little bit of a rundown of my so story but sorry i can't really share um uh, specific details of myself due to you know security reasons and whatnot so yeah totally understood before the coup happened well you, i should say you referenced that <clears throat> when the coup took place you realized right away you needed to do something to help your homeland and your home community and started to try to figure out what that was uh, Myanmar, of course, has a history going back many decades of uh, of really devastating policies that have impacted all sectors of the country, as well as many different groups living there. Um, so I'm curious, in the before the coup, were were you involved in any way in 
in any kinds of these programs in previous years, or was this something that you were just kind of living your life and fought pursuing your career? And when the coup happened, it suddenly awoke in you this desire to want to engage in this new way. Can, can you talk us through that process in you? Yeah. Um, um, well, to be fair, I, well, I wasn't really involved in uh, any of the activities uh, when I, before uh, the coup, I was interested in politics and stuff. Um, it really is kind of my, um, one of my interests. So I do keep tabs of what's happening. Uh, I do like to learn about history and then uh, ongoing events and whatnot in Myanmar and pretty much right around the world as well. And yeah, uh, I knew that, you know, uh, it's, all, it's been always on my mind that I do, do want to do something for Myanmar, uh, something for the community. But once a coup happened, I'm like, yeah, I really have to do something right now. So you could say that it, do, it did awoke in me that, you know, this is time to get involved. So uh, previously, I was like, you know, I was just focused on my career. I was just doing my own thing. But yeah, um, once the coup happened, I'm like, now yeah, this is the time for me to get, uh, get things going. So, mm, Right. That's really interesting. And to explore that a little more, I think, and kind of what, how that, awoken things up and then how you responded to it, you know, for myself as well, when the coup first happened and I was in America at the time, I, I just felt devastated. I just felt like I was this passive, helpless observer of history that was taking place half a world away by a professional military, knowing how bad it was going to be and just feeling so powerless in anything that could be done. And then once the decision is then made to be engaged, at least on my end, then it's, well, well, what can I do? And however small it is, what, who do I know? What skills do I have? In what ways can I be involved and be engaged? And that led on my part to realizing the power of this Insight Myanmar podcast platform, the wider outreach and events and networking we do, the Better Burma nonprofit that we developed and slowly over time start to realize, oh, I, I can do this. Oh, I can also do that. And that was the process I kind of went through in responding to the coup and then looking at where my role could be in it. So similarly, like you, you know, you you were also, as you described it, kind of doing your own thing and paying attention uh, politically. Also, I'm sure in a more local way and how events in Myanmar were affecting your, your, your own close family and community and friends. But then after the coup, something in you must have awoken in some way to decide that you want to engage in a wider way than you had before. And then you have to figure out, well, what do I do? How do I do it? So can you talk us through that that whole process that, that you went through in that period? Yeah. Um, well, I think I'll, I'll just have to bring it back right to actually back to 20, 2007. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with the Saffron Revolution, right? I think um, for a generation, like, um, you know, I'm in my uh, 30s. So I didn't really, what, what 1988 was, you know, I, I you know, that, that was like way before my time, uh, to be honest. Like, well, not really way before my time, it was kind of before my time. So I didn't really witness it. But um, back in 2007, I did saw, I saw, I, I saw like, you know, all the Saffron Revolution, I witnessed it. And um, that kind of has been on my mind. Like, you know, I know, I knew that, you know, this military, it's a brutal, sadistic, I would say, like, you know, that it's a cruel military regime. Uh, and I, I lived through it when I was young. So and now they're back in power again. Well, technically, they didn't really let go of power, really, even in the past, like, you know, five years of semi-democratic rule. Um, they were they were still holding on power. They're still pulling the strings and everything. But now they're back in they're back on the throne. They're doing this and they're they're going to plunge the whole country into darkness. And then that's really what I saw back on February 1st. I'm like, I was really devastated. And like, this is, this is bad. This is, we're, we're back to like, back to when I was young, this is going to be an age of fear. Uh, we're going to have to live in there. And just looking at it and, and suddenly I saw all these protests back in, Myanmar, like in various cities, towns, rural regions being staged. And that gave me a bit of hope. Like, you know, we do stand a chance against this military. Um, if we are united and if we do help each other, if we do our own part, we do have a chance to deal a blow to this military and topple it once and for all. That kind of, that's, that feeling started to 
take place in my um in my mind in my heart like um probably around in the early days of the coup really when i started seeing all the protests like it's like a, it was like a sea of people coming out waving all sorts of flags it, it gave me hope it really gave me hope and then um and the community abroad as well we started to come together a bit and start talking to each other like hey what are we going to do about this and and then it came to me that right this is the time to act this is a time that we have to act together we have to stand together and then um we have to play our parts. We have to do whatever we can. It, it may be small. It may be, you know, it, it could be very small, uh, but just doing anything that you can to stand up against a coup. I think, um, yeah, I think that that's the most important thing. That's what I saw, like whatever, however small or big the action is, as long as you're doing something, you're contributing something to this movement, to this revolution, this resistance movement, uh, I think we we're on the right path. That was my feeling. And then I'm like, yeah, I have to do something. I'll have to get involved. So yeah, I began to get involved in various activities, fundraising events, raising awareness, just talking to people, really just getting connections, just connecting back to even people um from my past as reaching out hey what are you doing what are, what am i doing and we just have to talk to people and then yeah i ended up in this uh medical network that i'm doing right now that's kind of what i what how it's brought to this so yeah that's a bit of my journey that a little bit of an awakening if you want to call it and that happened in my heart uh regarding this coup so mm, right and you ended up landing on doing medical missions. Uh, how did that come about? Do you have a background in medicine or did you have connections that were already doing that? If uh, I imagine also whether or not you had any background in medicine, the uh, what you're doing, which we'll get into in a moment, but the, the process of supporting these medical missions that all have to be underground uh, remotely, this, this is also something quite new to have to learn and take on. And so how did you get involved with this particular task and what were the challenges of having to learn something that was really very likely quite different from anything you'd done in the past? Yeah. Um, so I don't have any really, I don't really have a formal, well, any background in medicine really. Um, but I did happen to know uh, personally the people that who were working on this medical uh, medical project, this medical network, Healing Hands, the name is, uh, on ground. And um, I've always wanted to help people back in Sagaline Division. I have a personal connection back in that region. Um, so my uh, family background, if I, could, I could say, is from that area. So I really wanted to help people back there. And um even in these, some of the regions, some of these remote regions, uh, even before the coup, the medical access is a little bit poor, I would say. Um, and with the coup, uh, pretty much the public health care system has, system has effectively been broken down. The military has pretty much destroyed it. And there's a lack of medical care. There's a lot of injuries, a lot of IDPs. And then I'm like, I want to do something about this. Uh, and... And just so happens that um, some of the people that uh, I personally knew were working on ground and they were like, hey, uh, we're doing this thing and I heard you were doing some fundraising stuff. Um, do you want to help? I'm like, yeah, I'm in. So that's kind of where I got in. Of course, there's a lot of like, mm, there's a lot of challenges because medicine, medical, uh, it's, it's not my field at all. So I had to learn. Um, I really had to talk to those people and I, ha I had to ask them like, hey, teach me. So I had to learn the whole process again. Even uh, I just got involved and uh, I pretty much asked them to give me reading materials, uh, and, like, teach me what is this and what is that. And uh, even I, they would give me like basic kind of like first aid knowledge and stuff. So that was pretty interesting. Um, and yeah, and I also had to start learning uh, some of the names of the medicines and um, like, uh, this is what we use for this. And then I also have to start connecting, um, help, them, help them out with like ordering process and stuff like that as well. So it's challenging, but um, yeah, I uh, actually quite enjoyed it. Not sure if enjoy is the right word to use here, but um, I had to learn the ropes again. But yeah, it was a pretty uh, steep learning process, but yeah, I got there, I guess. Uh, I kind of rolled with it, but yeah, um, 
like again, like I said, um, it's a guy, as you know, it's a really hot zone right now. Um, there's a lot of conflict happening. There's a lot of military can- campaigns conducted by the military, and then there's saw like villages being burned down and stuff. Even some of my relatives back there have to run or uh, flee their homes. Well, this is pretty much like the textbook example of this Burmese military's tactics or strategy, I'd say. This is what they have been doing in a lot of these ethnic minority areas in, you know, uh, Arakan, Kitchen, Karen, Shan, uh, Kareni, etc. They've been doing this for like, you know, ages and ages. And then, yeah, they pretty much replicated the same tactics back in the, what we call the dry zone of the country. So they're doing the exact same um, textbook uh, tactics of the Burmese military campaigns and is waging this uh, scorched earth war kind of thing and is affecting the local population. And then I'm like, I got, just can't stand by and watch. And then medical aid is probably one of the biggest things that they are needing. So yeah, uh, I think I think everything, everything just came together for me and then I, I got involved and here I am. Mm, right. And yeah, the dry zone and Sagain division has have been has really been a hot spot and just terrible stories of the atrocities, really crimes against humanity that have been taking place in those rural villages that <clears throat> some of which you described a bit before. Um, before getting more into what you're actually doing with your medical missions, just to take one more point to focus on the context and making sure listeners are set up to understanding what's going on there. Uh, I wonder if you can share a bit about, from your understanding, why the Sagai Division has become such a hot spot for really the first time in, um, uh, well, I don't know how long, but uh, but but certainly in, in in the recent past, as you said, this was the kind of thing we saw Tatmadaw assaults against the ethnic areas, but not so much the the dry zone areas, the Sagai division areas. So, what uh, what has happened during this period to to make this into a, a hot spot? And then also, if there's just any uh, in terms of the military tactics, what they're doing, whether general or anecdotal or anything more you want to share to really set the context for listeners that can give them a better understanding of what kind of operations and support you're providing in this kind of tense environment. Yeah. So I guess previously, I think the, the biggest, like, you know, what we call the dry zone or really just the ethnic Burma when I think the last time we saw this sort of resistance against the you know the central government or military or whatever we want to call it happen was probably back in like you know after independence when the um the communist party of burma actually started rising up against the central government i think that's that was only the time when uh there was a big resistance movement happening in that you know dry zone area and ever since then dry zone has been relatively you know quiet I wouldn't call it peaceful because, you know, there hasn't been really any sort of peace under the success of military regimes. But, and back in 19, uh, 1988, afterwards, even then, um, there wasn't really any sort of military resistance movement uh, in the dry zone. There was like, you know, conflicts with, in the uh, certain borderlands and uh, ethnic areas with, you know, the, all the students um, uh, taking up arms to fight back you know, as the ABSDF. But, yeah, and about and really never really saw any sort of like conflict or anything until twenty twenty one really uh, ever since the time of post independence era, and um, I think that really came as a shock to the military as well in many ways. I, I would say um, they I don't think they were sort of expecting this from uh, the ethnic Burma to resist to put up this sort of like fierce resistance, and um. I think, and then that's when they started, you know, replicating this scorched earth, um, brutal tactics that they've been using in these, um, in the other ethnic areas. Um, yeah, uh, as you can see, Sagain is a hot zone right now. It's it's re- the resistance is very very fierce. Um, they're very uh, tenacious. They're very uh, resilient. Um, it has, it's been going on. It, what, Sagain and also Magui, um, another dry zone area uh, in central Burma is another um, really, really uh, strong uh, resistance area that's been resisting the regime. Also, even even before, like, you know, the all the uh, armed conflict happened uh, during the early days of the protests, it, places like Mongyua, um, 
and around those area, Mongyua, the Ze, um, it, it just around those areas is like a lot of like protests. Even the, the, these days, protests are still happening, even despite all the conflict that's happening. And it's like a really not a really really good, really large like people's movement happening there as well. And military is just attempting to crush those places. And the the, the tactics that they use is pretty. It, like I said, it's a textbook example of tactics. So what they've been doing is they would, would target the civilian areas. They know that we know if the people are suffering, if people cannot look after their own livelihoods, if people's homes are destroyed, they won't really have time to you know think about resisting the regime. Um, that's I think that, that's the textbook example that they're doing. And you know all all the resistance forces, like the people's defense forces, um, they they do have to look after the people. And then if the people are suffering, uh, they will not be able to um, actively uh, resist the junta or you know effectively fight back. So. They would target the civilians. It's also part of like their own little divide and rule kind of tactics as well. So um, they want to send this message that, hey, if you are resisting us, this is the fate that you're going to suffer. Um, if you don't resist us, well, yeah, we will leave you alone. I think that's kind of the little uh, divide and rule. In reality, that's not really true. If, if you don't, even if you don't resist them, they'll still, you know, burn your village. And as we have seen in several places, even the people that don't really, uh, aren't really involved in resistance or any sort of like movement against them, they're still tortured, killed, and their homes were burnt. So I think that that's a little bit of their uh, psychological tactics as well uh, that they're doing. So, well, uh, and all this is happening, villages are burning, people have lost their livelihoods um, and worse, uh, killed. So, in these times, I think I think this is called the four cut strategy as well. Part of that, so they try to cut all the access to food, medical supplies, communication. So some of these areas, um, there isn't any um, more internet lines. Like there's no four G, three G, even not not even two G. There's no, there isn't any sort of internet lines in some of these areas anymore. Um, and I know that in phone lines are not even available in some of the areas as well. So all communications are cut. And, um, yeah, it's a really, really terrible situation in there. Yeah, so like I said, in some of these areas, even before the time of the coup, the healthcare is fairly poor. Um, there's a there's a really, really lack of uh, proper healthcare or access to proper healthcare in some of these areas. And now with all these cuts that the military has done, all these scorchers tactics and um, blocking of medical aid and supplies and everything, um, there is more and more... It's, in need, in dire need of uh, medical access, not just medical, really, also like food, shelter, and everything in these areas for IDPs, uh, local populations, and all the people around there for the elderly who are in need. So, yeah, that's kind of the situation there. I know that a lot of there's like really, I can't say how much, but it's like so many uh, IDPs in just hiding in the jungles where they can't really go back to their homes. And even when they go back to their homes, they're all in ruins and there's nothing for them left in the village. It would, the military would just burn everything down. So, and they're in, living in constant fear of like when the military is going to come back or when they're going to, you know, attack them aerially, or will there be aerial bombs? So, yeah, um, that's kind of the situation there. Like I said, this is textbook example of Burmese military campaigns. This is Burmese military tactics 101, terror tactics to target civilian populations um, because they know that, you know, without the people to resist them, um, yeah, uh, you know, there's, there won't be any resistance movement there without the people. So they would target the civilians. It's, yeah, it, like I said, it's, is there a tactics one on one? So, yeah. Mm, right. So, I think that sets the grounds and gives the context for where you come in. So, if you can describe a bit about what your teams do on the ground there and how you've supported them. Yeah. So, um, our teams is called our, the name of our team is called Healing Hands. So, we're based in Zagain Division. Uh, we previously started off uh, a bit in uh, Chin State as well, but uh, really today, these days, we just focus on ground in um, Zagai. Uh, namely in Dizay and Mingin townships. 
So our group mainly is we we're we're we we're focused on uh, me- delivering medical aid to the local populations, but we also do uh, a few other things as well. So the main thing that we do, what what we saw in these areas is like, like I said, there's a proper that it lack it lacked a proper healthcare system or lack to a lack of proper what, how should I put it put this. Uh, uh, lack of access to uh, um, uh, medical resources, I would say. Um, and then what we saw was that this, we, we've got to do something about this. And then one of the things that we found was that even if there aren't, you know, properly trained medical professionals like doctors and nurses, what we could do was that we could set up these basic medical healthcare training courses and first first aid courses for the local populations. And if we could do that, um, it would at least relieve some of the areas in those places if there are people who can at least, you know, deliver some sort of like medical aid, like very basic medical aid really is like, you know, uh, basic sickness, uh, basic wounds and stuff. So or just, uh, it does help a lot. So what we, what we decided to do was we started to put together these um, basic medical aid courses or first aid courses. And just deliver the, the, those trainings to those people over there. Um, each of the courses accommodate up to like um, 30 to 40 people. Uh, so it's pretty good. We've done it up to, I think now we've just completed our fifth batch of training, which means like we've got at least 150 graduates from these courses. So where there's a lack of doctors or nurses or medical personnel who are properly trained, uh, we could at least provide some sort of relief of the pressures that these regions are having by delivering these causes to the local population. So at least, you know, they, they, they were like, hey, if you have a fever or some sort of basic sickness, um, this is what you need to do. So at least we could we can impart that sort of knowledge to the locals. But of course, uh, we also what we also do is we do set up some rural health clinic um, these are, of course, not like, you know, it's very specialized clinics because, I, again, we lack uh, medical personnel in those areas. So our team has one doctor and then there's only, I don't know, in Mingin and the Zay Township there. I don't, I don't think there's even like 10 doctors, probably is less than that, uh, even in the entire township. So uh, providing medical care to people. And like I said, the Zay and Mingin Townships are fairly large townships. Um, and it's not really sufficient to cover the entire township with, you know, very limited number of doctors, really. So what we also do is uh, set up these healthcare clinics, um, and uh, we would also provide them with uh, basic medical supplies and um, equipment that they need. And also to these um, trainees who have graduated from our courses, we also supply them with basic medical supplies, um, basic medical equipment like stethoscopes, PP cuffs, and stuff like that. So that you know when they go back to their I know uh, home place, um, they can start you know practicing. And of course, if there are any like really serious illness or injury happening, they would call our doctor or. Our, our proper doctor who's around the region so that we can refer to, you know, a, pro- a better, a proper medical care. Or if they need surgery, we also do our best to arrange that as well uh, with our doctor in house or to refer to or refer them to uh, another uh, doctor. So that's kind of how we have been running with um trying to help with improving uh, medical aid and medical care in those areas. Of course, like, you know, we, we also like distribute medical medicine to IDPs and our local populations around there. But I think one of the things that we really need to focus on is, again, this is also thinking about long term as well. It's the human resources part of the uh, equation there. So without probably training people, if we just keep delivering medical aid, you know, that's not really going to be sustainable. We need to train people. We need to train people to at least know what they're doing a little bit about medical knowledge. So we try to fill in the gap by um, running these um, running running these uh, first aid and basic medical training courses. And of course, uh, we do go around these uh, IDP camps and uh, villages affected by the conflict to deliver medical aid and um, healthcare. And of course, that comes, it's really difficult as well, like with the conflict happening, um, these are really hot 
conflict area. So we really have to uh, tread carefully in where we're going and stuff like that. So security, of course, still is an ongoing issue in tr- trying to deliver these uh, medical aid and medical missions. Um, and there is, again, a prop- uh, lack of a proper healthcare facilities or hospitals around there. So if there's somebody's wounded, we really have to improvise sometimes to um, save their lives. And um, unfortunately, we've seen a lot of people losing their lives and not just to injuries, like even, you know, during childbirth to illnesses that normally could have been cured, but they don't, we, they didn't have any uh, proper access or care and just lost their lives. We've seen so much of that happened. So there's still a lot of help being needed in those areas, really, um, not just in terms of like medical, proper medical aid, but also in terms of human resources and other sort of like facilities and stuff like that as well. We're trying our best to fill in the gaps, but there's still so much to be done. Uh, we're also trying to set up a little hospital somewhere around a secure area if possible. Um, because especially in terms of like surgical care, um, it's really difficult to deliver without a proper you know, facility to and then it's really like i guess it's like you probably know um it's really difficult to refer them to like big hospitals in big cities due to um yeah due to security reasons obviously so so yeah that's kind of the uh a little bit of an overview of what we've been doing and what we do around those areas but also not in terms of, not just in terms of medical but we also wherever possible we also provide food shelter clothing um that's not really our focus but we do our best to do that as well uh wherever it's possible uh, and also going forward we do have plans to help in the education sector as well because there's a lot of children uh who are fleeing from war and then uh we just don't want their education to stop so we are going to try our best to expand into that sector as well so yeah, that's a, a bit of the an overview, a general overview of the work that we're doing in the Sakhalin region. Yeah, thanks for that. And I want to go back to something you kind of talked around and touched upon, just the the, the risk factor, the danger that uh, that is posed by the medical profession. This would include patients, doctors, uh, training courses, mobile clinics, hospitals, just anything associated or even procuring supplies, bringing, uh, buying a large amount of supplies and transporting them somewhere. These have all become uh, security risks. You know, it's really uh, atrocious to have to say that someone who's in the business of administering healthcare is it, it, any part of that process is actually uh, not safe and having to take safety precautions, but that is the truth in Myanmar now. So can you expand on that a bit and just describe the uh, what kinds of risks and dangers people on the ground supporting this mission, whatever side of the activity they're on, what, uh, what, what risks and dangers they're facing merely by being in the field of healthcare these days? Yeah, um, I think it it goes back to the early days of the coup, really, I think, um, because doctors were one of the very first professionals to stand up against the military regime uh, with the CDM movement. So I think not just doctors, really, it's also doctors, nurses, medical and other medical professionals, uh, this and dental dentists, um, medical technologists, and uh, all, all the people, they were among the first professionals who actually, uh, others did as well, but they were they were really I- iconic, I would say, uh, quite pretty, pretty iconic that they started, you know, speaking out against the coup, they started, um, they started, they were one of the uh, pioneers of the uh, civil disobedience movement. So I think the military um, hasn't forgotten that as well. And like I, like you said, it's really sad to just think of people that that people who are saving lives are also being endangered by the military. It's it's a very very sad situation as well. Like I know that even in some places, um, you can't even uh, they won't even allow you to take paracetamol because that actually relieves pain. So they would confiscate paracetamol if they see it. Uh, that actually happened in some areas and that's horrifying really and there's a lot of risk uh in transporting um medicine as well if they 
see they would confiscate these large amount of medicines being transported. Um, and it, they won't just confiscate the medical supplies. They will also, of course, harm people who whoever sent it or whoever is receiving it. So there's also risks in that. Um, and also these rural clinics that we've opened, um, they are also in danger of being destroyed and uh, and people who are operating there being harmed if they, if we do practice them openly. So we do have to do it a bit, a bit of a bit like an underground sort of movement, even in those areas. I know some of the areas are secure, but some not really. So to even to effectively deliver medical aid, we have to make sure they're not around. So because if you do, they would block any sort of medical aid or delivery of any sort of healthcare really in those areas. They want they, they want people, they're, they're blocking or cutting access to all sorts of medical supplies and medical aid being delivered to this region. Um, so they've been cl- cracking down on all these uh, medical, uh, well, all these pharmacies, They've been cracking down on doctors, CDM doctors, nurses, and dentists, just really um, just cracking down on them, just arresting them. I, I saw on the news recently that some uh, CDM doctors being arrested, in I think it was in Mandalay, I believe. And they were also working to deliver medical aid to, I'm not sure where they were, but um, apparently they were involved in delivering medical aid to some of the conflict areas. And uh, sadly, one of the CDM nurses where she was murdered uh, during the interrogation process, apparently. So that was really sad. Just so, just to think of that, like people who are trying to save lives, and and their lives are also being endangered just by doing their jobs. So, yeah, um, and and for our network as well, we we have to work really, really. We have to lay low and work, um, work behind the scenes. Uh, we have to work very, very secretly in those areas to deliver medical aid. Of course, some of the areas are pretty okay, uh, especially in the areas that are controlled by the resistance or you no, know, there's a heavy resistance presence. It's very, it's quite safe. But uh, venturing forth, um, there are certain conflict areas that we have to cross over, and in those areas, no, it's not really safe, uh, and no, we really have to be very careful in planning our routes around those areas. We really risk, uh, we, the, the people on the ground risk their lives just to deliver this sort of medical aid to the people in need. And then, yeah, like you said, it's very sad, but it's really just a reality, but, and then we have to, something that we have to deal with, unfortunately. So, so yeah. Mm, that's also reminding me of the really, unfortunate kind of responses we've seen over the past couple months and even couple years of some Westerners and organizations and governments who have not really understood, I don't know how they can't get, you know, you can really find this news anywhere, but somehow they haven't understood that uh, or accepted the fact that this military has no interest in carrying out any kind of humanitarian aid, even apart from what they're trying to rule. And there's been this ongoing question for the humanitarian organizations, big or small, that are trying to come in and make a difference in Myanmar. Should they bring the military to the negotiating table? Should they try to go through the military? Should they uh, should should they by all means try to avoid the military and go through informal networks, which there's a concern that that however one feels about the military being in charge and their legitimacy, leaving that aside, that they they are ruling some central parts of the country. And so this for organizations where where these questions of rule of law and protocol and everything comes into play, that they're 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 by supporting these informal networks and avoiding the military, there's a concern that they could be um they could be seen to be going explicitly against the uh, whoever is in charge, which is something that these big organizations and governments don't like to do. So it's been this really messy situation of trying to figure out how do we get aid in there? Do we, uh, knowing the risks associated and the consequences associated with all parts of it, going through these small informal networks that 
are are very much under the radar of the military and you know the military would yeah, yeah, claim yeah. as illegal even though we would yeah. claim the military itself as illegal exactly. so and and then but then the converse of that of looking at going through the military where um, people such as you and I, and I think many associated with this movement, would just have very little faith that the military would actually do anything oh. with what is given. So I wonder if you just that kind of debate and controversy that's been going on as someone who's really active in this field of aid giving and medical. What what are your thoughts on the best way uh, for um, for for small organizations such as yourselves and even larger ones to look at uh, engaging and trying to get aid in there effectively? Well, no, probably the with 100% confidence, I can definitely say that if you, if you know these international actors try to deliver aid to the military, it's definitely not going to get to where it's needed. I'm I'm going to say that 100%. That's that's the truth. That's a reality. They have to face it. That that's not something that they can dance around. That's that's a reality. If they try to deliver medical aid through the military or its organs, that's not going to arrive in the hands of the people. Or if they try to give money if they if they give aid money via the military that's that they're going to use it to buy weapons that's that's a reality and that's um that's what they have to face if they are try if they're trying to deliver any sort of aid to the military and think that's going to be effective they're deluded i'm just going to say it all right that that's what it is that's a reality so um we've seen it all uh, we've seen it happen we've seen it in uh i don't know if you know about the cyclone nargis uh that happened uh back in i believe but like 2018 yep. sorry 2008 sorry yep, uh, i was there for that yep, yep, yep. so back there back then um a lot of organizations you know came to and uh, tried to deliver aid and uh never really got anywhere uh that you know even like these uh what what, what are they like some sort of power bars or energy biscuits and stuff. They ended up being rations for the military. So that happened before. And if people think, or these international actors think that, you know, um, they can effectively deliver aid through the military or any sort of the network, they've had the same lesson learned previously. If they're trying to do this, the same thing again, it's the second time. Um, uh, I think they're, quite deluded to be honest i'm just gonna have to i'm not gonna be i'm gonna be very blunt this time so um the best way probably is to if they can to engage local actors or local humanitarian organizations or even through other you know certain certain networks like you know probably national union governments NUGs, uh humanitarian uh or you know any sort of uh, programs that they are doing or any sort of like ethnic um, authorities probably as well in certain ethnic areas, they have their own authorities who can probably better uh, deliver aid or even so even certain local organizations or aid groups uh, like ourselves or certain uh, certain organizations and certain authorities, people, some of the places people have set up their own little um self-governing i would say sort of authorities they've started to do their own little things as well because pretty much like the military's um administrative organ has pretty much broken down so they've organized themselves into this you know uh, um, self-administrative uh, authorities kind of things so i think what if the international community wants to help in terms of humanitarian aid they really have to reach out to people on ground they really have to reach out to these um local authorities who are not affiliated to the military regime or through various other channels that's the only way that they can get aid to where it's actually needed if they're going to try to engage the military regime by any sort. I, I saw it on news, like, you know, certain even United Nations agencies talking with the regime saying that, oh, yeah, we're doing this thing. And then, you know, we have to engage the regime to work effectively on ground. But the question is, can you work effectively on ground? No. Um, what what would, what, what, what's, what will be the outcome of just talking to the military? One, well, you just give them more legitimacy. That's definitely for sure. Two, um, whatever aid you're going to channel through the military, that's not going to end up in the hands of the people. That's going to just going to end up in the hands of the military. 
the medical supply, if they're going to med- give medical supplies, hand over the medical supplies to the military, they're just going to use it for their own soldiers. If they're going to give aid money to the military, they're going to use it to buy weapons. Unfortunately, that's a reality. So the best way for them to do is to do the hard work, reach out to people on ground, uh, talk to uh, people who can actually deliver aid instead of um, engaging whoever that's sitting in Nebido right now. So I think that's my view on it. Um, yeah, I know that's been of a ongoing controversy sort of debate happening, but um, yeah, because like, like I said, the military, I, like, like uh, I've seen, you know, there's a lot of talk like, hey, we have to engage the military, we have to talk with them, we have to negotiate with them, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, we have to see this clearly. The military is the problem. It is the root of all problems in Myanmar. It is the root of all evil in Burma, really. So can you have the root of all problems? Can you have the problem as part of the solution? No, you can't. If you, you have to remove the problem to solve this. So you can't have the problem as part of the solution. The international community needs to see see that. You cannot engage or negotiate the military junta. I think uh, the people are like, I think the international community really, really needs to understand that, I would say, because, yeah, uh, it's, it's because negotiating or talking to the junta is not going to work. I'm just gonna, uh, yeah, I think I think that's the uh, reality. And then um, the national community needs to understand that. Mm, right. I totally agree with you. And another thing that stands out from those conversations I hear that sometimes just, just baffles me, and I hope that conversations like this had, had on a public platform can, can reach these people and reach these dialogues. I do know that we do get feedback that there are people in, in embassies, in uh, governments, in think tanks, and other organiza- big organizations that tune into this podcast and listen. We very much hope that these kind of conversations can affect and inform these bigger initiatives that some of the decision makers and decision and stakeholders that are, uh, that are tuning in can listen and get this information. But one of the things that I, I find is that, uh, that I'll hear from, from big uh, partners or stakeholders or governments is that they simply don't know the mechanisms of how to get in. And this always baffles me because I think, well, you know, uh, Healing Hands has their networks to get in. Better Burma has their networks to get in. There are many other organizations out there, small organizations that are are able to, with safety and with care and concern and, and, um, and deferring to the local conditions that are definitely able to be able to get funds in where they're needed to help some of these humanitarian missions. And with more funds, more help can be given. And so this is something that's always baffled me is this kind of dialogue from people saying that they're just not doing anything because they don't know how. They're just very confused by a military actor that is is uh, uh, is claiming to be in charge and yet is very unreliable and not knowing what other alternatives there are to go around. For those people listening, there are other t- there are indeed other alternatives to go around. This is not something we should be hearing anymore. The the for those that want to help, they should be identifying and finding these reliable smaller partners that would be able to carry this through and get it where it's needed. So I just I simply don't understand why I keep hearing that argument even after two years. I totally agree. That baffles me as well. I'm like well, they're better connected. They have, you know, better connections. They should be able to do more. That's what I'm, that's my general feeling as well. So, yeah. So moving on, another thing I wanted to touch upon is uh, you, at the start of your talk, you reference how you're a, a Burmese living in Australia. You've been there for some time. And so basically you're, you're a member of the diaspora helping those people that are in country. This is an interesting relationship that I think has not really been examined or, or talked about enough. And so it's something I'm that, that's been more on my mind and consciousness to want to be able to explore it and, and check in and understand it. So from your standpoint, where you are in the diaspora, helping those in country, how would you describe this relationship? And how would you describe kind of the responsibilities of both parties? And especially being a member of the diaspora, speaking for yourself, how do you take it upon yourself to see like what you can be doing, what you should be doing, perhaps what you should not be doing? 
um, where you can be helping or advising, but where then you have to stand back and defer and listen. Like, how do you how do you define those the nature of this kind of relationship and respective responsibilities? Right. So obviously, it hasn't been easy since day one of the coup, just being away from home and just really um, slowly seeing my homeland being torn apart, really. Um, and again, all the things that happened, and this, is, this, this isn't something that, you know, this isn't something that I've done at all. Uh, it isn't really even my profession, as in medicine isn't even my profession. So, like I said, I had to learn a lot, uh, I learned the ropes again and stuff. And then um, I think I just took it upon myself, really. I just, like I said a bit earlier, in the early days of the coup and then as things progress, I'm like, I needed to do something. I just can't stand by. I, I have to do something. No matter what's, no matter how small the action is, I have to do something. That, that has always been on my mind. Um, so I want to get involved. I want to help people. Uh, I just can't stand by and watch. Um, even I'm here. I probably could just sit back and just pretend nothing's happening, but I can't do that. Um, I can't just go to sleep like that. You know, um, if I sleep, even, uh, it's, it's always on my mind. I get it, Even if I do, I'm doing something else is this, this to this, you know, people suffering back home that's always on my mind. Um, I can't get it off my mind. Um, it's just been happening from day one of the coup. So I'm not saying everyone should be, you know, getting involved and doing all this thing. It's great if everyone can do that, but uh, everyone, different, different people have different sort of views, different sort of capacities that they can do. Some people will actively contribute funds um they will help people like you know they will they're very passionate in raising funds just, um donating funds to people who are needed uh some people uh are really act, are like you know go down the activist route like they, 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 they would they're happy more than happy to be the public face they would speak out raise awareness talk to uh various international actors uh, being the voice for the people who are back home who can't really voice out um uh, and some people uh, will help more, a bit more in depth, getting involved in these sort of like um, underground uh, humanitarian aid or other sort of movements as to help you, helping others out, uh, talking to people, connecting with people. So at least the way I see it, uh, at least this is really, this is more of a personal sort of opinion for me, I guess. So I'm abroad, I'm, I've been here for a while, but looking back it's my homeland that's where i grew up in i want to see it at least peaceful being free from the shadow of tyranny and oppression at least at least i want to see it that way uh, i want to see it prosper i want to see it become a proper you know peaceful place for for all the ethnicities and everyone that's living in there so at least this, I just saw myself like, you know, I need to do something. Uh, I want to get involved. I I wasn't just content in raising funds. I want to get more involved. I want to get deeply involved in delivering aid. What can I do more? I always ask myself, what can I do more? I think that's the question that I keep asking myself. Yeah, true. I'm getting involved with these things, these things. But I, to myself, I just keep asking there, there are definitely things, more things that I can do better, or there are things that I can get more involved. I can do more things. So, again, I have my day job doing here. So, I'm kind of doing two things or more at once, but I try because then again, like I said, um, my day job is my day job, but uh, really, there are more important things than career for me. So, which is you know, things are happening back home. I just can't stand by and watch. So as part of the diaspora, um, at least to me, I would say it's more of a commitment to this cause. I think that's the most important thing. It's a commitment to at least see my homeland being free of tyranny and oppression and fear. 
I think that what really drove me to do this, to what I'm doing, it's more, to me, it's not about patriotism or nationalism or anything like that. It's really just, I just want to make my homeland a better place, being free from all sorts of oppression. I think that's that's the thing that drove me. And of course, um, in approaching this, the best way for me to do it is to get involved in these sort of activities, raising funds. The probably the raising funds probably part is the the most important thing that diaspora can do for the people back home. Because as you know, um, back home, there's a limit on how people can support each other. People can support these sort of movements. Um, people are starving. People are getting into all sorts of trouble for helping them out helping each other out. So one of the biggest things that the diaspora can do is to raise funds and send back home, help people. The other one, of course, is to raise awareness as well. Um, just to, I know it's very frustrating sometimes, of course. Um, the issue of Myanmar has been like swept to the sidelines these days. You know, uh, if you talk to certain people, they're like, "Oh, Myanmar, uh, that happened like uh, in, back in 2021." Is every I, I think everything is everything peaceful right now? We don't hear it on the news anymore and stuff like that, you know. And that's like, no, it's terrible. What's happening? It's very bad. It's still ongoing. Um, that's another thing that the diaspora can do as well. And of course, just helping people out with all sorts of like different activities. Like there are things more things that you can also do in addition to fundraising and uh, helping awareness, like, you know, getting involved in these sort of like movements, um, these sort of like humanitarian aid networks, just to connecting with locals. And um, like I said, there's, there's a lack of internet access and you know, phone lines in certain areas. If you have the capacity, uh, you should reach out to those areas and ask them, hey, what can I do? What can I help? And also in terms of like, you know, depending on what you do as well, in terms of your profession or in terms of your capacities, there might may be things that the diaspora, people in the diaspora may be, may be able to help instead of like technical advice or, you know, some, any sort of like aid in, you know, developing those areas or helping those area, in, areas in need. So I think there's a lot of things that the diaspora community can do and then they are already doing at the moment. And um. But for me personally, it's more of a question about what can I do more? How can I get more involved? That's just the question that I just keep asking myself every day because at the end of the day, if I just, you know, turn back and walk away, I wouldn't be able to face myself. So yeah, and that's probably the sort of my thought process that's happening. I need to see it through the end. I need to keep going see it through the end of the road i need to see the end of the military junta and peace being i won't say restored but because there hasn't really been any sort of peace in myanmar ever since the days of post independence so peace being properly there's proper peace and tranquility in myanmar i think that's my uh, at least that's my sort of view and that's my sort of like you know little uh, mental thought process that I have. So, yeah. Mm, right. Thanks for that. And I think you hit upon that there's many different ways to be involved. And as I always say on this podcast, the very act of simply showing up and listening as any listener who's gotten this far into our discussion has, has done so already, that that itself is a sign of support. That is uh, donating an hour of one's time and mental space to be able to listen and care and think about these things. And then there's steps beyond that of, you know, sharing it or advocating or reaching out to the Burmese friends, of course, donating. And, you know, on that donating aspect, uh, if, uh, if, if one is so moved after hearing your story and, and the kinds of medical missions you're providing and the very unsafe situations there that one can make a donation to help that medical movement. Uh, one can certainly do through Better Burma. Uh, we are a uh, 501c3 nonprofit in the United States and so tax exempt. So any donations that would come to us earmarked 
to your mission and, and the, the medical projects that you're doing, that this is a way to not just simply listen and hear, which is, which is, uh, which is wonderful not to undermine that at all. That's, that's really great for those people that show up, but for those that want to go the extra step of from being a passive listener to an active supporter, that funds can actually be directed to the very medical trainings, medicine, medical missions, et cetera, that you're setting up that, that can support those people. And that can actually get through that does not have to go through the military apparatus that does not have to um, to be compromised in these kinds of ways that can actually be be put directly into the kind of medicine that is quite literally saving people's lives that are living through this terror. Uh, that's certainly true of small donors giving you know ten dollars, fifty dollars, hundred dollars, whatever one is able to. But if by chance we have leaders of certain organizations that are tuning in or governments that uh, there are networks, be they the ones that we are talking about, or be they other. Uh, nonprofits and small organizations that are also doing wonderful, courageous work. There are many of these small networks that have their way to get the humanitarian supplies and missions in that are necessary that can take these greater donations and greater uh, overarching missions that um, that that someone with someone or an organization with more capacity can be able to give, and so for anyone listening, there there really is not an excuse for uh, if one is uh, is interested in helping. But uh, there's really no excuse of why a but can be there. Really, the the question on the table is what is one's volition, what is one's means, and uh, and, and really whatever one shows up for. You know, I think that that that's um, as you. I, I like the point that you made earlier in this conversation that. Um, that it's really just looking, I don't remember how you said it, but it's really just uh, where, where, who, wherever anyone is at and whatever they have at their disposal, just really looking at whatever small things, whatever whatever small actions matter, those, those actions do add up to drips in a jar that do add up over time. And so whatever is it within one's volition and means, however small or however large it might be, that those all of those things do matter and giving that momentum to this and morale as well to this wider movement and uh and mission to want to restore democracy and human rights or bring democracy and human rights as you said i don't know when myanmar has really enjoyed that to the full level and uh, and i know also that these conversations they do give uh, a lot of hope and resilience to people listening i've heard from many listeners have written in saying that whether many many, many burmese listeners i should say whether they're in the country or diaspora and feeling some kind of heartache and hopelessness and and depression that whether we have on burmese guests they 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 they're able to share in the sacrifice and the courage and the commitment that they have towards this democracy or whether they're foreign allies like myself that are on and realizing, oh, we're, we're not alone. There are people that tremendously care uh, about this country and society and are helping in their own ways. And so just hearing these conversations and knowing that people are doing what they can in their own ways, that that does matter and that does help. So that's um, so hopefully this conversation has also done that to those tuning in whoever you are, whatever backgrounds you're coming from, as well as to give some food for thought of how support can be given in real tangible ways that have direct and immediate results. Yep. Yep. Totally, totally agree, mate. Totally agree. Like I said, um, even the smallest act of doing something matters. I think that's that's what, what I want to tell people as well, uh, whoever is in the diaspora or any sort of allies or friends of uh, Burma. Um, so every single act that you, they do or you do to help matters. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Mm, yeah, absolutely. So uh, before we close, anything else you'd like to add that we haven't covered? Um, so I just want to share a couple of like um, a few, uh, things that uh, happened uh, on the ground that we, that we see as well, a couple of stories that we, we saw. Um, so, Previously, uh, when we started off, uh, we, we also tried to send off medical aid uh, to other regions as well. We've sent aid to Kareni, we've tried sending aid to Chin, um, other places as well. And uh, we kind of have stopped, uh, unfortunately, because of the increasing number of IDPs and the people in need in our region, in the regions that we are operating in. So, um, but then again, at the same time, uh, because we have shifted all our attention to Mingyan and the Zaya townships, uh, we've been able to 
better help the people, uh, like, you know, uh, these increasing number of IDPs. We've done uh, uh, a lot of work in traveling to those camps. We've tra traveling to those villages, helping them, not just in terms of medical aid, we've helped them rebuild their ta their homes as well in certain places. Um, and we've saved lives. We've assisted in um, childbirth and pregnancy as well in, in these IDP areas. Uh, we've also helped people with, you know, injuries from, you know, uh, attacks from the military, like uh, from their uh, attacks from with their cannons and uh, aerial uh, bombardments. There are people getting injured from them. We've also helped them as well. Um, uh, we've, we're also doing our best to set up a little uh, sort of like hospital um, for the injured, uh, injury care as well. Um, we've also done uh, various amount of life-saving surgeries uh, in many ways that we can. Uh, we're also delivering certain uh, a certain level of aid to all these IDPs, uh, all these local populations, like just providing general healthcare services as well. And like I said before, it's not just in terms of medical aid that we've been doing. We've also been uh, distributing food and shelter wherever we can as well. And hopefully our aim for this year is to expand into educational sector as well. Uh, I know it's a little bit ambitious, but that's on our radar. We want to keep the education sector going. Uh, we want to keep the education for the children going. Uh, people, children affected by war, they haven't really uh, been been to school for, you know, at least now it's going to be over two years. We don't want the education to stop. And at the same time, we want them to have a better education or a better future for them as well. Like we don't want them to go through the same sort of education back, you know, back in like five, 10 years. Uh, we want this, this is for a new generation, a new, like I said, for a new, better, peaceful Burma, right? So it needs to be a better education for them, like a totally new sort of education uh, that will, you know, really, really um, aid them in being part of the future of the nation. So that's uh, kind of the uh, aim for us for this year to expand into educational sectors, set up sort of like self-managed schools. So I really would like to invite everyone and whoever is tuning into this podcast to help us out in achieving our goals. So our, our motto as Healing Hands is Journey to the Wounded. So we really, that that is our mission really, to work in these conflict areas and to deliver aid, m medical care, and beyond medical care to actual areas in need, actual areas, like actual conflict areas. We want to be there. We want to go there. And I know my friends, my uh the comrades on ground are risking their lives every day to deliver uh, these sort of aid to people who are in need. So at the same time, uh, we're facing a lot of difficulties in terms of procuring medical supplies, partly due to also part of inflation and um, really, really hard, you know, it's really difficult to get medical supplies these days sometimes because of, you know, all the, um, because there's a there's like a limited you know, stock inflowing into the country as well, and the prices have risen up. So it's like you know it, the the stuff that you can get for say you know um, five hundred thousand juts back in twenty twenty one, and stuff that you can get for five hundred thousand juts in you know twenty twenty three is vastly different. So there's a lot of um, costs regarding that as well, and um, in terms of these. Uh, 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 healthcare and first aid trainings as well. We intend to give uh, several more uh, trainings like that uh, to keep expanding the network and then keep teaching people the basics of medical supplies so that at least there is some sort of basic healthcare, access to basic healthcare in these um, conflict areas and these IDB camps and our local villages where healthcare to access to healthcare is pretty poor. So yeah, um, there's a lot of things that we are planning and, and we're planning to do and we're going to keep on doing. So I really would appreciate any sort of help. Like I said, no matter how small the act of helping or act of standing up against the military regime, no matter how small the act of resisting the oppression and just being the, you know, there, there's a lot of... There's, this is like, you know, 
a vast amount of darkness. And then if you can just be a candle in the darkness, and then and if we all come together and if we all become those little pieces or little parts of the light, and soon if we come together and if we illuminate this you know, darkness away, this evil, this oppression will finally be dispelled from Myanmar. No matter how small your act of resisting this tyranny is, it matters. And this is a cause that we believe in. And then this is a cause that we must believe in and we must carry on. We must keep in our hearts, keep in our minds that one day, one day, this military regime will fall and proper peace, democracy, and a better Myanmar, better Burma will rise in the future. So just this is my uh, parting message. Thank you. For whatever reason, even as the conflict in Myanmar continues to worsen, it somehow continues to be shut out of the Western media news cycle. And even when the foreign media does report on the conflict, it's often presented as a reductionist, simplistic caricature that inhibits a more thorough understanding of the situation. In contrast, our podcast platform endeavors to portray a much more authentic, detailed, and dynamic reality of the country and its people, one that nurtures deeper understanding and nuanced appreciation. Not only do we ensure that a broad cross-section of ideas and perspectives from Burmese guests regularly appear on our platform, but we also try to bring in foreign experts, scholars, and allies who can share from their experience as well. But we can't continue to produce at this consistency and at the level of quality we aim for without your help. If you would like to join in our mission to support those in Myanmar who are being impacted by the military coup, we welcome your contribution in any form, currency, or transfer method. Your donation will go on to support a wide range of humanitarian and media missions, aiding those local communities who need it most. Donations are directed to such causes as the Civil Disobedience Movement, CDM, Families of Deceased Victims, Internally Displaced Person IDP Camps, Food for Impoverished Communities, Military Defection Campaigns, Undercover Journalists, Refugee Camps, Monasteries and Nunneries, Education Initiatives, the Purchasing of Protective Equipment and Medical Supplies, COVID relief, and more. We also make sure that our donation fund supports a diverse range of religious and ethnic groups across the country. We invite you to visit our website to learn more about past projects as well as upcoming needs. You can give a general donation or earmark your contribution to a specific activity or project you would like to support, perhaps even something you heard about in this very episode. All of this humanitarian work is carried out by our nonprofit mission, Better Burma. Any donation you give on our Insight Myanmar website is directed towards this fund. Alternatively, you can also visit the Better Burma website, betterburma.org, and donate directly there. In either case, your donation goes to the same cause and both websites accept credit card. You can also give via PayPal by going to paypal.me slash betterburma. Additionally, we can take donations through Patreon, Venmo, GoFundMe, and Cash App. Simply search Better Burma on each platform and you'll find our account. You can also visit either website for specific links to these respective accounts or email us at info at betterburma.org. That's Better Burma, one word, spelled B-E-T-T-E-R-B-U-R-M-A dot org. If you would like to give in another way, please contact us. We also invite you to check out our range of handicrafts that are sourced from vulnerable artisan communities across Myanmar available at alokacrafts.com. Any purchase will not only support these artisan communities, but also our nonprofit's wider mission. That's Aloka Crafts, spelled A-L-O-K-A-C-R-A-F-T-S, one word, alokacrafts.com. Thank you so much for your kind consideration and support. Oh, ba, yarananda, da, 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 yar